Oranje, rood. All right, welcome. You're with so many people. This is this has never happened before here at the Better Break. All right, we are happy to welcome Robert Dijkgraaf today at Science Park. He has done research here for several years, and in the meanwhile, he has become a scientific icon. I can say he appears on Dutch television, and he inspires a lot of young students here as well. Um, today we will talk about the string theory, his main topic of research. Um, what is this string theory? A lot of people, I think, don't know anything about it. I hope uh, after an hour they will. Um, and what is the scientific value of this string theory? It's so abstract and we'll talk about this as well. Jaco de Swart will lead this session. He is a PhD candidate here at the physics department. Um, you're welcome to, um, to uh, ask questions. You can raise your hand. We will walk around uh, if it's possible um, to reach you. Um, all right, let's uh, give a big applause for Robert Dijkgraaf and Jaco de Zwart. Very, very nice. Um, uh, I think we're, uh, we're all very, very honored that you uh, uh, came to join us here. And uh, I think we are also very, very glad to see that you all came in very, very great numbers. So thanks for that. Um, Robert, welcome. Mm. Um, perhaps we can start off um, with you saying something about how your typical day looks <laughs> like. Not, not in the Netherlands, but when you're uh, at the Institute. Uh, how does it look? Yeah, so, uh, well, first of all, wonderful to see you all here. It's a really great honor to uh, be like back in Amsterdam. And uh, now I've been a professor here uh, for 25 years this year. So uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, most of you weren't born when I started as a professor. Um, yeah, so uh, my, uh, my current job is I'm director of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, which is uh, uh, an independent research institution. And so my life is, uh, I would, it, it consists of three parts, as everything, um, which is, I think one is, uh, and it's also reflecting, I would say, my main interest and passion. One is uh, to do research, which is, uh, you know, the Institute has pretty good reputation in, in, in physics and math, which is, are my own fields. Second, I love to produce or to think about creating opportunities for others. So just kind of doing the administration, so to say, doing the dishes, um, uh, leading the institution. And the third, I think, is you know, uh, doing outreach, uh, having contact with outside interesting people who are interested in either the science or the issues. So I spent also a lot of time on the road. Uh, and you know that includes many things. It could be uh, you know advising governments. It could be talking to students. It could be uh, fundraising, which is also something we'll have to do. Uh, and um, but I would say that's like the uh, the external part. And for me, I think uh, somehow finding I like to say try well. You know, by juggling these three balls, it means that you're kind of failing at everything. That's uh, so <laughs> I try to fail equally in all three and feel. <laughs> Kind of comfortable, yes. <laughs> so, and your your day is like a, a, a three part, and you you walk around the institute, and then you uh, then you think about these things, or well, the institute, as you know, is a very special environment. It's you know, it's very quiet, it's mm -hmm. very focused. Um, so, I've uh, by the way, the best commute in the world because uh, it comes the the job comes with a house, and it's the house actually where Robert Oppenheimer worked for a uh, lift for for twenty years. So, it's a lot of history. Uh, we have Einstein's grand piano in our living room, so you now as a physicist, it doesn't get much better. And it's, this, uh, just, uh, it's a, it's a three-minute walk along this famous path where on all the pictures you see Einstein and Gödel. So uh, I think it's somehow the most significant commute in the world. That's and what and I you walk <laughs> that every day. And I walk that and I <laughs> uh, sit in my office, talk to people, go to seminars. Um, but I must say also a fair amount of travel. Uh, in the United States, but also uh, to Europe, Asia, all over the world. Yeah. 
Okay, and now you're here uh, in Amsterdam, back. Uh, you've been professor for 25 years. Um, so um, w what's your, let's say, your most, uh, your nicest memory of doing physics here in, in Amsterdam? Well, most, I would say, the largest part of my career has been here. And, um, and one thing that gives me great pleasure is to say, so uh, that in some sense, uh, when I came here 25 years ago, uh, I really felt, you know, this is kind of almost kind of growing up. I felt this was the place where I could kind of start my research, uh, you know, a young professor, um, and I have seen it growing. I mean, that's the wonderful thing. I mean, in some sense, um, uh, uh, wonderful colleagues uh, who are here now, of course, Eric Verlindes here, who was, you know, he and his brother, we worked together with the three of us many, many years, but also other colleagues, Karel Jans Goud, and so there's a whole group we grew up as a kind of a kind of a gang of uh, graduate students in Utrecht and totally unsupervised in some sense. And it, I must say it was a terrific period. Uh, so those of you who are, who are PhD students or will be, enjoy it because that's you know, the time where you can be really, you know, you can do anything you want, so to say. Sounds good. It was a very good period. And then I think uh, coming here, actually I think I've seen this kind of uh, whole field grow. Uh, I Which think field? The string theory. Well, I think string theory, but I would, in general, like uh, math, physics, astrophysics, that kind of area where, of course, I'm very interested in. I think, you know, and, and Amsterdam has grown, I would say, in both in quantity and quality. And I've seen many, many young faculty members joining. So I think to, to, to witness this, uh, I mean, I've been, and I'm still am, the, the, the main cheerleader for uh, science in the Netherlands. I, I really feel this is something we do well, very well. And I think just is being exemplified here in Amsterdam. Yeah, it's a terrific atmosphere. Very nice, good to hear. Um, I think we're all glad to hear that, uh, I hope at least. Um, you all made the right choice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and one specific memory of which you think, okay, um, would be because it was not here at Science Park, right? You were No, we were, I, I remember one thing, uh, just one little memory that, uh, uh, now in string theory, we'll talk about string theory in a moment, we have an annual conference. And they are now quite large-scale operations, but they used to be very informal. And so, as a group of young professors, actually, we organized this conference here in Amsterdam in 1997. But we did it in a very informal way. But it was a large conference. And I still remember uh, sitting at the opening ceremony, waiting for the participants to come. And we looking at each other, well, you know, we forgot to give any indications how to get here. <laughs> so, will they find uh, the conference location? And then I know the first uh, speaker came and he had a little printout of Google Maps and a compass. <laughs> I think, oh, we'd be okay, you know, these, these are physicists, they find their way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, compass. Um, okay, well, uh, um, then let's... Uh, Go to business, yes. uh, because you mentioned you're a, a string theorist, and we would love to see your passion yes. for string theory. And um, so we would like to challenge you to uh, give us a short overview of, let's say, five to ten minutes. Um, what is string theory? What is string theory in five minutes? In five minutes. Yes. <laughs> Will you accept this? I'll challenge? make. Uh, I'll, I'll make an effort, and okay. I'll use the blackboard. Is okay. I hope that's not cheating. No, no. no. I, yeah. I, I hope not so. Okay, so um, so I would say this is actually trying to explain the main challenge in fundamental physics. And uh, so what we have in physics, we have two terrific theories. So one is the theory of the quantum, quantum mechanics, quantum field theory. Uh, now, and that's, you can learn a lot. It's about particles, it's uh, about forces. Uh, it's trying to understand matter and forces in the world. And, we have some tricks to do this, and the tricks we do is, we'll, of course, we do it in terms of particles, and then we calculate how these particles scatter. And I'm drawing here one of these diagrams. It's a Feynman diagram. It explains roughly which particles hit which other particles, and then there are a, a set of rules how to calculate. And I would say that's a tremendous achievement. So just to see the number of Nobel Prizes that went to this. So it's only a handful of particles uh, very strict rules, it's the most precise calculations done in science uh, 
are you know up to de 10 decimal precisions are computed in this in the theory so it's it's terrific uh, great success uh, and then there's another theory which is the theory of gravity uh, which I would say is equally successful so it's of course the uh, start with Newton but now we have Einstein's theory of relativity very elegant mathematics also kind of beautiful concepts but a completely different concept so here we have the uh, idea of a space-time that could be uh, possibly curved so here's space-time well here we had uh, particles and uh, forces so as long as you don't mix these well that's not quite true I would say both of these uh, theories have great difficulties uh, in some sense they do not work um, and let me just briefly indicate what the issues are so the first thing is in quantum theory these theories they are very efficient in calculating but uh, in a mathematical way in a formal way they do not exist so there are certain questions you can ask and you get like infinity you, you know it just kind of blows up uh, so we know this theory is only an approximation some things have to be added and there are some few hints what should be added there are some little things that in the kind of standard model of particle physics that do not work and they all point out that there might be new forces or new particles or new interactions at very very high energy levels at, at, or very small distance scales much much smaller scales than we can presently probe with our particle accelerators so there are there are fundamental issue is if you go to very high energy or very small fields the basically the theory becomes inc inconsistent uh, the whole universe would explode would decay so it's only an approximation and a similar way in gravity there are big issues and as as one physicist said no it's uh, if you calculate the solution of Einstein's theory of general relativity you find things like black holes and uh, the Big Bang and, and many other issues which uh, where the equations stop so f as the physicist John Wheeler said how can physics lead to no physics you know, how can the theory itself tell you it's incomplete so both halves are incomplete and on top of that we know there's only one universe there's only one world only one reality and it's working right just currently just look around you, you know the nature is working so nature found a way to complete these two pictures and and even more combine the two and if you try to combine gravity with quantum theory you have great issues the first issue is that if you add a gravitational force in this picture of particles and fields it becomes much worse then you get a lot of infinities this is simply uh, not a good theory it blows up on the other hand in quantum mechanics you know you always have as you many of you have learned there are uncertainties there are probabilities uh, particles are not following one particular trajectory there are many trajectories if you use these rules here you get a big issue because it means that space-time itself is not fixed it's like I'm standing on this stage and the stage is kind of fluctuating it's quantum mechanical I don't even know anymore what it means to be at a particular space and time point so there are practical issues in both cases that the theories are incomplete you cannot calculate anything you want they cannot stand on themselves at themselves and there's a problem if you want to combine them and you should combine them because the universe combines them so then uh, like 30 years ago or something certainly out of the sky at that point uh, it was said uh, a piece of 21st physics fell out of the sky people discovered string theory and in, in a kind of caricature way what string theory does it 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 replaces points by little loops and if you do that these kind of diagrams look very different they become to look like these diagrams you see them in any so this is a space-time picture of a little string that moves through space and time and um, what happens is that actually now this theory becomes calculable so these kind of amplitudes you can compute 
And this seems to be a theory of quantum gravity. So it's combining, combining these two, different points of view, and you can start calculating. Now, I think we will talk about some of the issues that appear once you have the theory. But I think at this point, what you should understand here, that there is a mathematical framework, there's a set of equations that combine the two points of view. And when that happens, you know, it's phys physicists became incredibly enthusiastic, say, wait a moment, it's possible to unify these two different th theoretical frameworks. And furthermore, there's some way in which you can look at the world both in terms of particles and forces, but also in terms of space-time and curvature and you know, black holes and whatever. And these two kind of points of view can be kind of brought together in a consistent theory. Now, that theory was kind of born, more or less, well, it has a very complicated uh, history, I won't go into it, but in the modern incarnation, it uh, was basically born when I was a PhD student, so in the 1980s. Uh, we were incredibly enthusiastic, because finally, it looked we were at a stage where we can really understand the universe, everything. And then it has been a very slow process where I would say, and I would love to talk this in the conversation, we discovered many features of string theories, but sometimes they looked like they were bugs, problems. And then they looked to be, again, features. So the, there's always this kind of glass half full, half empty. I don't think we are at any stage of complete understanding. But no, one thing changed and, and will not go away, that in fundamental physics now, we have at least a candidate to describe reality, a mathematical precise theory that's able to combine the two fundamental points of view that were uh, brought here in the 20th century and that we, in some sense, uh, are being verified and, 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 and computed with and we see the consequences of both of these frameworks every day. So I'll, I'll leave it at here, at this, yes. Yeah. Take the mic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not that hard. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, amazing. It was indeed nine minutes, I think, was it? Um, very nice. So perhaps um, given the, the short ex explanation, we can turn first maybe to uh, um, somebody who also has a question because you, you guys can come a little bit closer because we're not the only two here. You are you're also here. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Just say, oh, if, if there's a conceptual thing, maybe a small question you want to uh, um, uh, uh, elaborate on. We have, we have some time maybe now for, for this. So if you have the mathematical model, then again, I look back to the previous question. What is your day-to-day -day job? <laughs> so what people do is I think they, uh, you start to explore this model and do calculations and ask questions. So one inter interesting point is if you have a theory, what does it mean to have a theory? So you... Uh, and I think we have seen that in string theory through the many, many years, is that you know, if you have a theory that explains quantum gravity here, then you can ask various kind of questions. You know, how, how does the theory solve this? How does it solve that? So I think one thing I'm particularly interested in, many of my colleagues, is to uh, bring this theory, theoretical framework to issues that are really deep inside the issues of quantum gravity. So for instance, black holes. So I think you know the understanding of black holes, the fact that uh, in some sense they are uh, you know the most singular objects that we have in uh, in in the universe. We now know they exist, and remarkably, string theory I think at this point is the only working model that can describe quantum black holes. So that's something that you know, I'm thinking about, and many of my colleagues are thinking about. Okay, interesting. Um um, and perhaps you ca can you uh, tell us something about the thing that people also maybe wonder about, which is a feature of, of string theory. People say that there are more dimensions than, than the one that we... Yeah, so this is a very... F so uh, that's the first point I want to kind of mention, that uh, you know, if you start to learn more about this, how does string theory work, it turns out that uh, in first approximation, it's like a, it looks, looks like totally useless theory because it doesn't live in three space and one time dimension. It uh, requires more dimensions of space. So it actually requires six more space-like dimensions. 
So the first look, well, this looks like very silly, it's not describing the world. But then people very soon realize, well, wait a moment, if you, and it's a very old idea, if you start so-called wrapping these dimensions, so making them like small compacts, like you could roll a piece of paper into a tube, you have one dimension would be very small. So perhaps these six dimensions could be very small. And the moment you start doing this, you find something interesting. The choice of how you wrap these six dimensions will determine the properties in the remaining four space-time dimensions. So you can, what we call kind of geometrical engineer, by describing this internal space, which is a very complicated mathematical object, you will find certain properties in our ordinary space-time dimensions. For instance, you find what the set of particles is, what their, uh, their forces are, and uh, what the strength of these forces are, what are the, the actual numbers that you would measure in the model. So this is on the one hand terrific, and I remember you know, the early days, people thought, well, perhaps there's only one way to do this. Now, there's a, fun there are actually, there's a fundamental uh, approach to physics, which I would say Einstein really had. So I think Einstein had the idea, there's only one way you can fit all the pieces of the puzzle together. There's only one way to describe a working, consistent universe. And then you will find out it's us, no? And so it has electrons and it has protons. It's exactly what we are. So string theorists tell, well, we could realize that dream because perhaps we can find the unique way to curve these six extra dimensions. But this is an ex a perfect example of a feature that turns into a bug. Because it turns out it cannot be in one way. It actually can we can do this in an infinite number of ways. And so what happened is that instead of looking for a specific model, we got a huge set of models. And then the question is, well, how, how did the universe pick this particular way to wrap the internal dimensions? And so lead us to this particular choice of particles and fields. But th there was even something much more dramatic what happened. It is that you know, in the old days, so I would say before string theory, if you would be a physicist, you would say, well, okay, I tried to describe the world, so I want to find a model that describes the world, a set of equations, etc. So string theorists tried to do that too, but they find another, I think, amazing discovery, that if you give these models, looks like you have various different points, they turn out to be all connected. So if you pick one model, I can push it and pull it and slowly move it to another model. So we then introduce this concept of a landscape. So there's not, there's not one specific solution. There's a whole space of solutions to string theory. And we, we had hoped there was only one that was unique and it's us. But so now the question is, uh, what determined that particular solution? Uh, you know, can we determine the solution? And uh, was, was it decided at some point? Was it decided at the Big Bang? Is the dynamical reason why we have the particles that we see? Or is there, was there an opportunity for uh, nature to have an alternative? And that's, you know, that's a very deep philosophical question. How far are we with that? I think we haven't moved very far. I think we, we, want, want we put a lot of energy in describing the landscape. Uh, but I, I want to actually frame it differently. I think anybody here who does science, so somebody say, what's science? You know, science is, uh, in one line, it's predicting what comes next. Right? Science is you know the world, you study the world, and then you calculate what, what's next. You, know, you, you predict, uh, perhaps. You know, um, so you have a system, you have some set of equations, you have some principles, and it tells you, what comes next? So anybody, I think, here who studies any piece of science, they study the equation, there are many solutions. No? Anybody here, so study the hydrogen atom. You know, there can be many, many different... Uh, and if somebody says, yeah, but, but why this solution? That's not even a good question. That's not what science does. You know, I'm the science is not trying to explain why the two of us are sitting here and having a conversation. Okay. But science is uh, predicting if I drop the mic, what will happen, right? It will drop, with, and I can calculate the speed, etc. Make an ugly noise. S right. <laughs> so, but now, you know, if you think about really a, a theory of everything, it's not only describing the mechanisms, but it's also then 
part of it is describing how did we end up here. The so theory of everything, that's what string theory is. It's a th well, it supposedly would describe all particles and forces and whatever, all the, all the degrees of freedom that are in the universe. But you, apparently you also have to describe the one solution of that set of equations. So how do we pick one solution over another solution? And you see, we never meet this in physics, but we do meet it in areas like cosmology. Because then you say, well, whatever happened, there was something was set at the Big Bang, you know, some initial conditions or something, and then the universe evolved to be. But this, this point of finding not only the equations, but also the solution to this, I think, that we, I think we did a lot of work on the equations and describing the space of potential solutions. I think there's like almost zero progress in uh, understanding why this particular solution that we're now currently living in was the preferred one. Okay, that's interesting. So please feel free if, uh, if there's something uh, happening. Um, maybe we can go to a question in the, in the corner there. How do you test string theory? Mm. Oh, that's a, that's a terrific question. That's like the, uh, the, the key question at this point because there's a, as you, most of you know, there's a huge debate whether string theory is testable or not. I, I'm not sure if everybody knows. Okay, so that's, no, it's, it's, it's related to the point that there's such an, uh, there are so many degrees of freedom. There are so many choices you can make. The landscape. The landscape. So you would like to say, well, you look at the standard model and you see, well, there are 17 particles. Um, they have an three basically forces between them. There are many parameters, there are roughly also 17 parameters, there are lots of numbers that appear, and you want to understand these numbers, you know? Why is the mass of the electron what it is? And we, the hope was that string theory predict this. Uh, but it almost feels, well, string theory can, f to in, in this area, there are, it's, it's, I, I don't think it made any specific predictions. It says, you know, if you, uh, if you have a certain model, I think you can see whether it can kind of create that model by finding the right solutions. Uh, so, but I think that's a very narrow view of what string theory would be, because you know, if it's a theory of everything, it means you can ask it anything. Uh, so to test it, you know, can you can ask questions about black holes. You can start asking questions of cosmology. Um, and there are some very specific questions that string theory has answers to, like, for instance, what are the number of degrees of freedom in a black hole? These are difficult to test with current technologies. Um, so I think, you know, and I'll be completely honest, you know, when I was a student, I remember when I was a student, uh, the, uh, the first so-called so string revolution was there, and we were sitting in a class studying particle physics, and... Uh, uh, a very famous uh, Dutch uh, physicist, Peter van Nieuwenhuis, who works in Stony Brook, came to visit. He uh, occasionally came to visit. I think that was, this was 84 or 85. And he comes to, he says, oh, you know, then at that point the first solution, this first wrapped space solution was found. He said, within a week, we calculate the electron mass. And we students felt, oh, we'll be out of jobs, you know, physics will stop in a week or two. <laughs> and we just missed it. Well, uh, that didn't happen. Uh, by far, it didn't happen. So, uh, I would say at this point, uh, you know, there are the predictions that string theory makes are very general nature. So, it, it's, it says something about the nature of gravity. You know, it tells you about what the symmetries you will find in space and time. So, it's, it is imaginable to, to find results, calculations, uh, that actually disprove string theory. But, you know, kind of a smoke and gun, so now you, we predict this particular particle, uh, you know, if you currently, we are me measuring at, at the LHC and CERN, and, you know, there is no prediction from string theory, this particular particle you will find yes or no. Uh, honestly, if they find a particle tomorrow, it probably will fit into string theory. So, this is in some sense uh, a disappointment, I think, honestly. We, we had hoped, I think we all hoped that Einstein was right. There's only one way in which you can make a working model of nature. Uh, nature doesn't seem to, even mathematics doesn't seem to go in this direction. So, we have to be more creative to... T so, what I think actually, in the end, the way we will come to such a final theory will be an iteration of experiments that might tell us well, you know, in that big landscape, this is the area 
where nature wants to be, and we will study it more, and then perhaps we understand special features there. But I think we need some experimental help to get there. I think pure thought will be, uh, is perhaps too much to ask, but you know, the, the real results, uh, the real impact of string theory can be very different. It could be you know, in cosmology, it could be in black holes, we don't know yet. Yeah. And then um, what is the, the, the latest breakthrough? Because the 80s is some time ago, actually. Yes. Uh, so I would say the latest breakthrough, it's again already, you know, 20 years or something, but it's this whole, uh, so it's, it's usually called the second string theory revolution, which happened around 95, 96, 97, when suddenly the theory really came, I would say the right-hand side of the blackboard came into the picture. It was not only about adding and improving particle theory, but asking deep questions about gravity. And so understanding black holes, understanding uh, the role of information, the role of, I mean, basically thinking of it as a theory of gravity. And you know, that has been incredibly successful. There was a famous paper written by, uh, at, well, still a young physicist, Juan Maldacena. He's actually a professor at my institute. And it's the most cited paper in physics I think ever, like in the last 60 years, which is pretty amazing. You know, it's, it, it, on average, it's cited a few times a day. <laughs> so um, that way of looking uh, at quantum gravity has been incredibly uh, impactful. And it not only, by the way, in particle physics, but all, even in areas as condensed matter, uh, cosmology, now in quantum information. So thinking about how gravity and quantum mechanics come together has been incredibly productive. So I would say the latest breakthroughs are really in that particular area, thinking about uh, what, what the fundamental nature of space and time is. And you mentioned final theory. So is that, is that the end of our knowledge? Is that also the end of all the other disciplines? No, 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 no. So I, <laughs> no. So I think, you know, it's, it's, um, I think, you know, it's a lot of um, ambition, so to say, of physics to even want to have a final theory. Uh, as, as Steven Weinberg called it. So it, it, what we mean by that, a set of mathematical rules that describe the fundamental law, laws of nature at the, at, at, the, at the smallest distances. So it could be a set of particles and fields, perhaps strings, um, and, but that's, you know, that's equivalent to s telling a mathematician that you know, I gave you the definition of the natural numbers. So you have your final theory of number theory. Well, that's not true. You know, then you say, what are the patterns these? So I would say, even if you have these fundamental laws, and you know, come on, you know, it's, it's, it's important to realize that you know, even 50 years ago, we were, totally, uh, we were totally hopeless in our even imagining how we could describe the particles and forces that we know exist right now. So it was just a big mess. And then it turns out it can be captured by these 17 particles, uh, just a small number, and actually one mathematical equation. Or you can buy beautiful t-shirts that have the standard model on it. And you know, so you can carry a single equation that describes everything we see around us right now, uh, except gravity. So that's, that's an amazing quality. So nature, if you look at the, just the the history of science of physics, it's, you know, we go deeper and deeper, and it becomes simpler and simpler. It becomes more elegant, you know, we have more powerful mathematics. So I would say, like, nature would really play a mean trick if it simplifies, simplifies, and then it can, becomes very complicated and chaotic and ununderstandable. That's a certain hope you have. I think a certain hope, and I think there are indications, you know, if you, nature gives little hints how even these forces might want to unify at very high energies. And we see, you know, we see actually physical evidence pointing in that direction. So I think it's very likely there will be such a theory. I think it will be found. I'm not sure it will be found in my lifetime or your lifetime, but you know, it's, it's a realistic thing to imagine. But then only the fun starts. You know, it's like uh, in biology, you, know, you, have a f you have a fundamental theory of biology, f it's called evolution. Uh, it's a terrific idea, explains essentially anything in biology, but the details matter, and there's lots of biology left to discover, so the same way in physics. But I think at some point, you want to know what are the rules. Interesting. So, 
Um, perhaps we can, and I think this is a very interesting theme, um, the one just mentioned now. And perhaps we can touch this uh, a little bit more because the testability um, of string theory. So on what scale are we talking about? So wh where are we in, in, in the world if we look at strings? So uh, to uh, give an indication, uh, the, uh, the Planck length, which is the fundamental scale where we know all of this would be visible, is uh, 10 to 19 GeV. So, and that's uh, roughly, I uh, have to be careful, uh, well, 16 orders of magnitude com compared where we are right now in our measurements, right? So that's many, many, many orders away. So actually building a uh, accelerator that will measure these effects seems to be very difficult. Yes. And, and but it's not impossible. It's not impossible because, uh, just to mention one point of view, uh, now we know that at the very early part of uh, cosmology, in just say after or perhaps just before the Big Bang, there's a, f a theory in cosmology called inflation, which basically says that you know in a very very like 10 to the minus 34 seconds after the Big Bang, there was a part, there was a very small period where the universe not only expanded as it does right now, but you know exploded in a tremendous way, where the very small distances were blown up to cosmic proportions. In fact, <coughs> if I think if you do a poll, many, many physicists think that if you look at the very early, so if you look at these baby pictures of the, uh, of the universe, now you see, no, we all know, very in the very beginning, there were very small fluctuations, like one thousandth of a percent. And so, and these fluctuations, they led to all the structure around us. And you can ask, where did they come from? Why did the universe start in a in a completely flat, it's like a small ripples on the ocean. And there's an obvious explanation that these small ripples were these quantum fluctuations, the, uh, you know, which happened at the scale where string theory might be working, and they were blown up you know, by uh, many, many orders of magnitudes. So in, in some sense, the universe itself might be one of these kind of uh, gigantic particle accelerators, and it's a huge microscope and allows us to peer down. So it's not unreasonable to expect. And you know, at some point there was hope even that we had concrete results, but that you know, in, in cosmology, we might be able to probe these extremely small distances. Okay. So, so maybe to uh, give a little bit of context, because um, there are some colleagues, physicists of you, who are actually worried about the methodology of string theory. So mm. what is going on here? Can we ever test string, th uh, string theory? Yes. It is so small. Can we ever um, find something to prove that this is indeed the, yeah. the way the world works? Is this something you also worry about? I think you should always worry about that. But, you know, it's important. Uh, no, my, 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 mo my favorite cartoon uh, from Fokker and Sucker, who I think you're all familiar, is that they're standing with a, uh, some kind of bubbling uh, piece of equipment and then... Fokker says to Sucker, he says, uh, oh, very well, colleague, but does it also work in theory? So, uh, uh, theorists are about explaining why things work, right? And uh, a good example, by the way, is uh, Einstein. You know, when he wrote down his theory of relativity, uh, when Einstein passed away in 1955, if you look at uh, how his work was being described, I found one where it says, it's like a great piece of art. It's a wonderful philosophy about space and time. That's kind of deadly. As a physicist, that's the last thing you want to hear that your work is like a piece of art. It means it's totally useless and you know, <laughs> it's not taken seriously. And in the 1950s, if you were trying to think about experiments testing general relativity, like, okay, let's measure gravitational waves, which is like one part in 10 to the 21 or something, was totally unthinkable. Uh, because there wasn't the, the measurements weren't there. Uh, I, we had a conference where some of the graduate students from the 1950s were there, and they had great fun. They were doing all this kind of useless stuff. Uh, cosmic lenses, uh, gravitational waves, gravita they were just doing things, and, well, well, you know, and, and they were being criticized. Now, others were doing real physics, they were doing transistors, they were doing uh, quantum mechanics, particle physics, nuclear physics. It was all happening. Uh, biology, 
why were these guys and girls doing uh, gravitational physics? Well, 56 years later, now this is a hot topic. Uh, we celebrate the detection of gravitational waves, and certainly all these things were totally immeasurable at that time, are now measurable. So, by definition, if you're a theorist, you're running ahead. I, I agree that now we are running far, far ahead where experiments are, but not necessarily so. I mean, it is imaginable that there are new ways, new consequences, new kind of measurements that, you know, will come by. And I think we need also the experimentalist and also the, the technical stuff to progress so that we at some point we can measure. So I'm not worried that, you know, some people think, have to think deeply about these issues. Um, I often make the point that, you know, you think that uh, many people think scientists, they only worry about like the latest particle, um, you know, the newest device. But actually you can think about what is space, what is time. We still don't know. We know that the th answers we have right now are only approximations. I think it's very important people think about that. Uh, what is the universe made of? How does it, I mean, these deep questions, we need reflections. And then if an experiment, if, if my colleagues say, well, what have you done for me? You know, we, you have been working on this for, say, 25 years. You haven't had any concrete results. Well, I, I, I hope that human beings will think about these questions for many, many centuries. And so, you, well, it's, in that sense, it's good to talk to mathematicians, you know. They have these problems that are uh, like Fermat's last theorem that uh, take, took f many centuries. Many of them work on the Riemann hypothesis, perhaps the deepest questions in mathematics. And uh, nobody dares to predict when this solution will be found. I think one of the great thing is that in science, we ask the deepest questions that are there, and it's a long journey. So we shouldn't be too bothered too much by the fact that we can test. I think yeah. actually I would almost uh, caution the other way around. I mean, I love the criticism of my colleagues, but if you start to define science as something that you know you always within a year or two or three can have results, you start to think almost like a, a, a granting agency. You know, that's a kind of a very bureaucratic way to think about what science is. Now, uh, just as you, um, I know you partly philosophers, so you know, it, it, it's part of his, uh, our duty to ask these deep questions. And the beautiful thing is, it's not only asking questions, you can actually do the calculations. You can do very precise calculations. It's about you know, thought experiments, it's about imagining certain crazy stuff, like throwing something in a black hole and it escapes again. You can't actually travel to a black hole and do the experiments. Not yet, yeah. uh, but you, know, you can do it in your mind. Um, and I often feel, you know, the last thing we do is to need a thought, please. So uh, I think actually in string theory, the problem is not that we are too, the, the ideas are too crazy. I feel the ideas are not crazy enough. Okay. I think we are in some sense swimming very close to the shore. Uh, we, we, we try to go slowly a little bit beyond what we know. I think we need really radical ideas. And I think our young people in particular, they should show just jump in, you know, jump into the deep and uh, try to you know, build your own theory of everything. You know, just ask these deep questions. Okay. Um, so perhaps that's a good time to see if there's somebody who uh, uh, wants to comment on this or has a, has a third question. Here, in front. Can't you just make string theory always work because of all the degrees of freedom? And if, it, if you can always make it work, no, you, you cannot, because you know, it's a very rigorous framework. So, um, you know, there are, uh, I don't want to become too technical, but there are, you know, for instance, there's one prediction that you know, it, it could describe many forces, and some are stronger, and other are weaker. But for instance, there's one outcome that you know, the gravitational force is always the weakest. So, you know, if you, if you, so it's easy to imagine you know, detecting another force or something that would violate these rules. Again, you know, we'll, uh, uh, there are many other attempts at you know, theories that, for instance, break the symmetries of space. So we have continuous Lorentz symmetries in space-time. Uh, string theory predicts that they're still there, so, which is quite remarkable. It means that even though at some point you want to replace space-time with something that you know, often in cartoons it looks like something granular, like little, little bits, um, it still has the smooth symmetries that we also see. So 
Now, if you detect something where that symmetry is broken, you know, it couldn't fit in string theory. Those are another general rules about how, for one thing, it's a truly quantum mechanical theory. Uh, there are many people who believe that perhaps quantum mechanics has to be changed. Well, if, you, if that's the outcome, then string theory will be in certain problems because it's, 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 it's a very conventional theory that it fits in quantum mechanics. So it's not that you can, you know, if you give me some set of measurements that I can find a string theory solution, not at all, no. Yeah. It's a, it's a very interesting question, and this is maybe the, the type of philosophy of science questions that they have is like, can we think of up a test um, uh, if, if this test is positive, then we should throw away all of, of string theory. Well, I just mentioned a few. Yes, yeah. so, so, so uh, in that sense, string theory is falsifiable. In it the, is, in the yes. Uh, the question is, you know, do you find these results? Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, and so I would say many of the things that we usually measure, they are the predictions of, uh, of, of our current theories. So they're also predictions of string theory, that's fine. But you, know, you have to look at certain... So it's easily imaginable to find something that would disprove string theory. Yes. Okay. I think that's good to hear. So, and uh, you, you said something about um, being too conservative. So I mean, I, uh, perhaps I want to make another point here, because okay. people do confuse these issues sometimes. So, uh, so for instance, the fact... You know, there is a, there's, a, uh, there's a much broader discussion about, you know, what is science, you know? And, uh, People tr sometimes try to uh, say, well, scientists, they also make up things, you know, you just, uh, okay, it's a bunch of dots and you can draw any line connecting the dots. I think, wait a moment, no, no, we have very, we have equations, etc. It's not that we make up things, it's not crackpot physics, it's not crackpot. Uh, so I think we have to be, uh, people have to be aware that if we debate these questions about what is a theory and to which extent is it, predictable you know it's 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 something else than saying it's not science you know I would say it's very difficult to make a prediction out of biology you know if I say okay I find life on planet earth are the elephants yes or no you know, it's very difficult to make that prediction uh, but yet you know you can study biology so it's not that you know we can predict everything uh, so there are always these kind of limitations of scientific theory. It doesn't mean it is not science and it's not an, uh, an objective reality that we want to describe and that we have a, an approximate uh, approach to the truth, etc. And I think that's something that I think we have to be very careful that these two different views on predictability and what science is are not being confused. Okay. So in, in the sense that you said that perhaps people are being too conservative yeah. in string theory. So how would a satisfactory future of string theory look for you? Let's say in 10 years. Well, I think it's very important you ask deep questions. And uh, so, I, uh, um, so I think, you know, if you would have... Uh, the most satisfactory answer, I would say, would be the following. So um, take, for instance, so perhaps it's too much to hope for. But let me just share two kind of examples that uh, in, in just that happened in physics the last 100 years that are very, very satisfactory outcomes. So the first I would say is general relativity. Now you set, it's a nice set of equations, etc., but it is something much better. Einstein had a fundamental principle on which it was based, and the fundamental principle was that anybody moving in any way should have a consistent way to describe nature. So that's the theory of relativity, essentially, that you can always... So there was a fundamental principle and if you know the principle, and you know some math, and Einstein knew very little math, so he just got it from Marcel Grossman, you know, his uh, mathematical friend, then you get the equations. The equations are an outcome of the principle. Um, that's terrific. Another f wonderful example is our description of uh, the strong force, so quantum chromodynamics that's describing basically nu nuclear physics. Um, there's an equation there, um, which is QCD, you know, Nobel prizes have been given for it. Uh, it has no parameters. So it's, it's just an equation. There's no, there are nothing to be tuned. And it, it gives an infinite set of predictions. Now it describes all the possible excitations of nuclei. And so if you, in that theory, it's perfect. And you have one equation, no variables, nothing to tune, and you get an infinite set of predictions. So I think something like that would be terrific. I think actually in string theory, really lacking the fundamental principle what's based on. 
So I'm trying to explain here, if you go from particles to strings, certainly you're describing gravity, you're describing um, space-time, geometry. Why? What is the fundamental... You know, this is just a manifestation of an idea. It's not the fundamental underlying principle. So I think one thing what we would like to see is what is the principle on which this theory is based? If you have a principle and then I start thinking about it, that I'll come to these equations. I now only have the equations. I don't understand how they have been derived. Okay. So then I look again and uh, I see a hand over there. Thanks. That would be nice. Um, sorry, uh, what would string theory um, uh, mean for quantum computing? Mm. Uh, so, I would always have said nothing because it's a completely, you know, quantum computing is about uh, ordinary quantum mechanics, it's about, it's, it doesn't have anything to do to gravity. But this was, I think, the point of view uh, till uh, a few years ago. So one thing what happened in string theory is it's, uh, as I said, it's, it's able to describe quantum gravity, but it does it in a very uh, particular way. So this, this all goes back to this paper by Maldacena, who actually showed that you can describe string theory and gravity in terms of an other system. So that's the so-called holographic principle, it's a theory living in a different space dimension, uh, typically one space dimension less, that has no gravity, etc. Uh, that actually is just uh, simulating, it's almost like you simulate, as you simulate in a computer code, the, the gravitational part. So that means that there's another way to describe quantum gravity, including black holes, etc., using a, a piece of ordinary quantum theory. It has no gravity and nothing. So then you can turn things around. You can say, wait a moment, but then if I have a quantum mechanical system and I want to describe, for instance, the information in a quantum mechanical system, I can use the language of gravity and space-time. I can kind of basically see a black hole. There's not a physical black hole in the quantum computer, but uh, the, what the quantum computer is doing is equivalent to describing a black hole. So nowadays, what people are doing, they're using basically Einstein's relativity theory, trying to explain the properties of information in quantum systems. So it, it's a kind of almost kind of applied quantum gravity theory. It's the, the, it, so in that sense, the gravity theory would not live in, in three plus one dimensions, but would live in four plus one dimensions. And it's a very hot topic. So I would say uh, the current state of affairs, if there's one um, common denominator of I would say almost well huge part of theoretical physics, or even you know, experimental physics, it's quantum information. It's being used in, uh, in, in nanotechnology, in quantum computers, but also it's the key way to think about gravity. And that's beautiful uh, intellectual line, I think, because it's, as I said, one of the key questions in quantum gravity is how to understand black holes. Now, black holes are mysterious objects. They are, at the same time, it's often said, the most complex and the simplest objects we know. Uh, it's a black hole, it's just a hole in space, nothing more. But if you see how much information that hole contains, it's the most efficient way to pack information. So many physicists feel that the black hole is what the atom was 100 years ago. Now, the atom was the part where the laws of mechanics and electromagnetism uh, broke down. Well, it led to the birth of quantum mechanics and all of that. So I think black holes are our current uh, kind of... We always need something that doesn't work. Uh, so I think very important for the students here to realize that, you know, if you, if you don't have something that doesn't work, you don't know where to focus on. So the fact that there are deep conceptual holes, mistakes, problems, in our physical understanding, and the black hole is, I think, your, the Big Bang is the other one, um, these kind of uh, consistency of the standard model is the third one. By focusing on these places where you know that nature found a solution. Uh, we know the universe is working. So nature was able to combine these two things. It's an incredibly productive uh, point to think about. So that's where you should focus on. And it's, I like 
that question very much because I think you know it's it's all also about the nature of information, and you know it's many of us have this kind of dream that this final theory or something, you know, it should be a theory that explains all this, but almost by definition, should be a theory that isn't about particles, it isn't about forces, it isn't about space, it isn't about time, all of that should be the result of it. So what is it? Well, perhaps it's pure information. Uh, in some, that's just a slogan or something, but uh, I think that's what uh, okay. drives us at this moment. Very interesting. So, uh, thanks for the question. Perhaps for the, for the final minutes, let's zoom out a little bit. Because uh, they're not only string theories here, I think. Um, so let's zoom out a little bit, and uh, we, we talked about um, people being a little bit skeptical of, of string theory. Now, there's also a tendency currently of uh, a lot of people being skeptical towards science yeah. itself, yeah. Uh, and, and mainly in the other side of the ocean where you're, you're based. Um, all over the world. All over say. the world, yeah. perhaps. So is, is, there, is there a link between the, like the string theory skepsis <laughs> and, and that? No, I, this, I, I, I would wish uh, uh, that would be a real impact of, uh, you know, we didn't, uh, string theory didn't lead to the election of Donald Trump, no, uh, or to Brexit or whatever. Uh, no, I think what you see is something that uh, uh, I would say, you know, the world is at, at, this, at this current stage um, not very friendly to, I would say, both the, the methods and the results of science. Uh, so. And I think it's, you know, and, and there are many, many things that drive this. Uh, I would say, actually, perhaps the most important thing is the, the impact that science is making. You know, if, if we were just doing, you know, abstract number theory, nobody would worry about this. The fact that string, the or, uh, string theory is, is no result, it, it isn't impacting. I think people are more upset about the real everyday impact science is making, whether it's about climate change, whether it's about... Uh, you know, artificial intelligence or, or uh, you know, messing with life and with matter and it becomes very relevant. So, you know, there are uh, large economic consequences and so people are pushing back. Um, so I think it's in some sense, it's, it's a good thing. It just tells that we are relevant. Um, but I think one thing we, ha we are fighting also is that the, uh, I would say the methods of science, which is, you know, careful argumentation, uh, seeing the path towards truth as a long process, always indicating what you know, but also what you don't know. Um, you know uh, having respect for that you can have various points of view on the same issue, and uh, that you can you know, have a dialogue between and that. And All and of that, I think, is, is not very conducive in the current political climate. So I think, you know, it's... Uh, and I find it's a very interesting debate among the scientific community what we should do with this. You know, should we, uh, uh, should I kind of just uh, sit behind my desk and do another string so theory what calculation? What would you advise the people here? Well, one thing which I found very telling, so um, actually at my own institute we had a very intense debate last year okay. exactly about this issue. Uh, what should you do? And it's more pregnant in, in, uh, in living in the United States than here. And some of us actually uh, went back to the archives and looked, you know, what happened in the 1930s uh, when there was a large influx of refugees from Europe, uh, in the 1950s when there was McCarthyism in the U.S., right, where people were accused of being communist um, and, and, and lost their jobs because of that. And what we found is that there's always been a very intense debate in the scientific community. You now, what should you do? Should you uh, uh, engage? Should you speak out? Should you be kind of an activist? Should you kind of uh, retract, you know, go in like an uh, inner asylum or something, you know, just, you know. Uh, and uh, I think actually for many people, at least the last years, have been kind of a wake-up call and that we feel, well, perhaps we have to be a little bit more actively engaged with the world around us and explain what we're doing. And at one of these debates, somebody asked me, well, Robert, if you have a magic wand, and you could make everybody understand one thing about science, what would it be? So that's a good question, you know, you might have your favorite, you know, some people say, well, the second law of thermodynamics, or uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, my, my answer was actually uh, the scientific method. The fact that you have a consistent way to approach issues, that you, you know, you, you make predictions, you do experiments, you look back, you 
ask deep questions and you slowly move towards truth. And I think that's a great quality, you know, that's, uh, and I think people should understand that. Somebody actually in a, made the point that, you know, given all the, some of the negative reactions we, f we find uh, against science almost, some people even in the US, they talk about a war on science. You know. I think that's kind of a heavy language, but you know, there's uh, many scientists feel under siege. And by the way, not only in the United States, in many other countries, like in Turkey or in Hungary these days, you know, in, in, in Russia, etc. Um, so I think, you know, it's, uh, it, 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 I think you, you, you have to speak out. And what's happening, if you look at it, perhaps, you know, people are also outside the scientific community are slowly becoming a little bit like a scientist. You know, they, uh, they want to understand why you're doing it. They all want to be critical, which is a good thing. You know, it's a good thing if people are critical. Mm. But then they should take the next step, start listening, being convinced, and you know, engaged in a dialogue. And I think that's what we have learned in science. So I think you, uh, we have to both, I personally feel we have to do two things. We have always have to communicate what wonderful results we have, you know, all the breakthroughs, all the beautiful open questions. So that's for the people here too? Yeah, I think, but you should also explain uh, why you do science and uh, why it is important to, to know this and, and, and you know, what drives you. And these are things which are, are kind of more about the process than about the outcome. Uh, and I often I feel, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful discovery in also in yourself. Well, there's this thing, you know, many of you must have had, you know, you're at you, sometimes you call this uh, Oma's Fiada, so, you know, you're your grandma's uh, birthday, and people say, what are you doing? You know, what, what are you studying and something? And then you have to explain in five minutes you know, what you're doing. I think that's terrific. You know, you sh we should do, do this more, explain to people what science is all about. Yeah. Okay. So I think a beautiful note to end this conversation. Um, so um, I'm afraid that we're short on time for the questions. Is that correct? Um, yes, that's a shame. Uh, but um, I think we should all Thank Robert now uh, warmly for uh, uh, this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That's all that's left to say for me. Thank you, Jaco. And of course, thank you, Robert Dijkgraaf. And, oh. I left this one. And um, I'll see you next week already on Wednesday to the beta quiz. And I would like to hear a big applause for Robert Dijkgraaf.